everyone. We are live. Uh, got Mondo Gonzalez here with me tonight. And I'm just quickly typing in one last note. Sorry that we don't have the really cool uh, two-minute introduction that you guys like so much. I got hit by a copyright violation over the music about two months ago. And because of that, my royalties income has really gone down the potty. Um, so sorry about that. It's going through the court system or the legal system right now. I got the music from a company uh, that it had the music up for sale or not for sale, but for you could buy the rights to use it for like three, four years ago. In this last spring, some guy in Eastern Europe somewhere, Romania, Hungary, something like that, put up that song on his channel and claimed a copyright for it. And YouTube is honoring that music is his copyright. And I complained and, and YouTube turned me down. So now it's got to go through the normal legal stuff and who knows how long it's going to take. So at any rate, we got Mondo Gonzalez with the, tonight and uh i'm gonna do just a couple of uh prayer requests for myself and then we're gonna go right to mondo so first of all folks i want to ask you to pray i got two engagements coming up i've got a lutheran church i'm preaching in here in north dakota on sunday january 14th and a lutheran church i'll be preaching at in saskatchewan on february 18th both of these are tremendous opportunities to uh, minister the prophetic word in circles where only some of them are really strong in prophecy and others are interested. So pray that God would give us grace in that. Um, I also want you to pray for this whole legal thing with my introduction music. I'm just a little bit peeved over that, but the Lord's will be done. Last thing here is I, I have some wiring on my home that I need to do. The, the, I got the upstairs, the top floor done. Of modern wiring, but my main floor and my basement are still 100 year old tuba knob. And we need to get this replaced. And I'm just struggling to find the time to do it myself. So let's just pray that God would work a miracle in that regard. All right. Well, I don't need to introduce Mondo Gonzalez, most likely, because I'm sure almost everybody in the audience knows who he is, knows that he is. Um, part of the Prophecy Watchers team, that he does a lot of programs with them, travels for conference speaking as a representative of Prophecy Watchers and at the Prophecy Watcher conferences themselves. So, Mondo, why don't you just give the people a little bit of your story, like two minutes, five minutes, that you were a pastor, how you got interested in prophecy, and how the Lord led you to where you're at today. Yeah, the... Uh... I was a pastor for 16 years, uh, started really even younger than that, volunteering. And, and then immediately after getting saved in 1993, uh, the Lord brought me right into prophecy, really brought me as well into immediately into uh, understanding dispensational thinking. It works well with my brain because I like things to be orderly and literal. Uh, I never did good in poetry class. Um, because I like things to be straightforward, but the, the Lord brought me into ministry uh, in, in started in Illinois and then went to Moody Bible Institute. I got a degree in Jewish studies because uh, not so much I was going to go into Jewish missions, but again, I wanted to understand the Jewish background of the Bible. Uh, and so learned Hebrew and stuff like that, where I often say that if Jesus was Chinese, I would have learned Chinese. I mean, because that's just what you do. You got to learn the background. And then uh, continued to go to school, wanting again to learn the Bible more. So I went and got a degree in archaeology because, again, that helps understand another layer of context for hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. So it's not so much that I was ever wanted to be a professional archaeologist in that regard, or but just to learn the, the background, the methodology, continue to do some archaeology here and there, uh, which I do enjoy. But again, the goal is to understand the text, and that really is my heart. And so on that, when I think about prophecy, uh, watching prophecy begin to unfold over the last 30 years has been pretty amazing. And then the Lord brought me here uh, about two and a half years ago to Oklahoma and to be a part of the Prophecy Watchers team and, and uh, to meet Gary. Never had met Gary before. 
And so it was really, it's really fascinating and then to be able to come and bring in some of the other gifts, the archaeology, the, the pastoring, the, the hermeneutics, you know, teaching the scripture every week and then to bring in some of the astronomy stuff that we're doing. I've always enjoyed it's It's been just a pretty amazing ride so far. Well, it's been fun to watch uh, Prophecy Watchers exploding growth since I first got introduced to them about the same time you did. And it's been an amazing ride. And and to hear Bob and Gary talk about some of the older days, that's that's an even more amazing ride. It really is to, to where, you know, obviously they're legends. I mean, uh, Bob and Gary and for them to go all the way back to the JR Church days, I remember getting the Prophecy in the News magazine you know, 15, 20 years ago, and then to see them go off and really the, what's fascinating is they started with nothing. You know, they, when they left Prophecy in the News, they, they, they didn't take any mailing list. They just left quietly. And so they started with just this little dinky camera and God said, no, I'm going to make something big. And so here we are, you know, I came on just again, a couple of years ago, but for, for the ministry nine years old, but to see what God has done, I mean, it truly is what God has done in nine years. He wanted this ministry to exist, which is fascinating. Well, brother, tonight we're going to talk about what's going to happen with Israel after the rapture. So I think a good introductory point here, if we're going to talk about what happens to Israel after the rapture, perhaps we should start with the question of why do you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Yeah, it's interesting, Be again, because uh, because I'm drawn to understanding the Bible from hermeneutics. Again, my entire life is, well, how do I interpret the Bible? What's the proper way to interpret the Bible? Again, through context, 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 linguistics, other things. And what I find, too, is the, the, the way that the, the New Testament um, interprets itself, the way that the New Testament interprets the Old, um, the, the Old Testament, one of the, the easiest thing is, I think, why preacher? Well, mainly because uh, all of the prophecies of Jesus um, were, were fulfilled literally. And so when I think about the prophecies of the second coming, there would be no reason why we would switch the rules in the middle of the game. And so when you, re when you, when you understand it straightforward, again, that like, for example, we're going to talk about Israel, but there's not a single time in the entire Bible, especially in the New Testament, does Israel, the word Israel, ever mean anything but ethnic Israel? Some people will say Galatians 6.16, but I think if you look at that, that's the only place that, that's the first place that those that take non-literal, um, we don't need to go into it, but if, if you really look at that in its context, it means Israel very clearly. And so the fact that Israel means Israel helps me to come to that understanding that Israel means Israel and the church means the church and the church is, an, is, an, is, a, is a new body of believers that's when people come from either a Jewish background or a Gentile ethnic background and they want to become Christian, they become, you know, and they go into the church. And so to see the promises that are made to the church as it relates to this rapture, and then also to see, the, as we're going to discuss, the things that are prophesied to happen to the nation Israel after the rapture, we recognize that uh, the, the time of the tribulation period post-rapture is the time where God redirects his attention he's always looking at israel there's no doubt and, and it, the bible says he never takes his eyes off the land either right deuteronomy 11 so he loves the land but he begins to address the world through the nation israel again and to fulfill what we understand is the 70 weeks of daniel again very specifically literally fulfilled and to see how this that 70th week applies for the holy people and for the holy city straightforward it shows, it, it leads you right down to a pre-trib position, in my view. Amen. So it's exciting thinking about the fact that God has future plans for Israel. What are a few of these Old Testament promises that he holds out for Israel? So I think some of the, some of the best ones um, are clearly the ones that haven't happened yet. Because again, you have this idea that people will say, well... The Old Testament promises to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the, is the perfect Israelite. Therefore, everything has been fulfilled in him, and there's nothing forward to look to. But, for example, uh, in my mind, okay. Psalm chapter 2, God says that why do the nations rage? They plot a vain thing against the Lord and against his Messiah. And God says, oh, no, he laughs, right? 
And he says, I'm going to set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And so in Luke 132 as well, you have Gabriel telling Mary, I want you to name him Jesus. And he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. Well, we know that Jesus is up in heaven on the father's throne. And that's fine. He's at the right hand of God. But that's not David's throne. David's throne was never in heaven. I mean, it was in Jerusalem. It was in a very literal place. And so when, when you think about the prophecies related to Israel, one of them is that their Messiah, their king, would rule and reign literally from the literal Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, this, the Messiah is going to put his foot on the mountain. It's going to split, and you're going to have all this uh, topographical changes. I think the other thing, too, which to keep it very simple, is in Isaiah 11 and other passages, it speaks about the wolf laying down with the lamb. It speaks about the lion eating straw like an ox during this coming kingdom where the, the natural world is going to be restored under the banner of the king of Israel, the Messiah of Israel. And that hasn't happened literal. Even right now, there's no way you can say, well, that's fulfilled in Jesus. Well, in what way? So again, what, what ultimately happens is there is a figurative or a spiritual application to these uh, promises. But I look at them and go, well, it's interesting that in the Garden of Eden, the lion was a vegetarian, according to Genesis 129. And he's going to become a vegetarian again during the millennial thousand year reign. So there's complete consistency from what God started in Eden, what the, the, the millennium was going to be like. It's going to be a complete transformation where finally, and one of my favorites, is the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord, with Israel as the head and not the tail, and with Jesus as the king. So, Amen. Th th those are just some of the things that we look forward to that can only be <clears throat> um, fulfilled in a very literal way. And again, which makes sense. We're not changing the rules. It's very straightforward. Well, how about just giving us a few things that you think are going to happen shortly after the rapture and going up towards the tribulation and then including the tribulation? What are some of these early things that God is going to do with Israel after the church is out of the picture? Well, th this is a great question because there's, there's, as you know, and I think you would agree with me that some of this, some, is speculative as it relates or conjecture as it relates to the timing. Now, we right, know they're right. going to happen. And, and what I mean is, for example, um, we know that the rapture is not connected to any specific event. It's it's It can happen at any time. But we don't say, well, the rapture can't happen unless A happens. So, uh, however, so this is very important because I think so many people misunderstand this. Nothing must happen before the rapture. That's right. But Prophetic things can happen before the rapture. That's it's right. It's just not a requirement. So, for, for example, one of those is Ezekiel 38 and 39. There's a lot of different perspectives on the timing. Um, you can have scholars like uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtebaum, who believes that the the beginning of the Ezekiel 38 Magog War is going to happen three and a half years prior to the start of the tribulation period. So what he does is he looks at it as 10 years prior to the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, well, others will put the start of Ezekiel 38 and maybe in the gap, if there is a gap after the rapture, uh, prior to the start of the tribulation period, whatever that might be. Others will put it maybe right at the, the beginning of maybe the 70th week of Daniel. So that is one example where you have the the, the God Magog war happening somewhere uh, prior or right around that time between now and, the, and I guess we'd say the beginning of the 70th week or in the, right at the start of it. So that's a big prophecy that's going to influence so much of the perspective of Israel, because over and over in that passage, it talks about that two things. The nations will know that's right. that the Lord is the Lord of Israel, and because he's coming to their defense, and it's earthquakes, it's to, totally supernatural. The other thing that it says is it says that God's holy name would be made known by his people. Now, that doesn't mean they're saved yet, because we know they're only saved through Jesus Christ, and that happens at the end. But what I see happening is when that happens, today, if you go to Israel, 80% of Israel is secular. They're atheist or they're agnostic. Okay, they, they don't think in terms of the God of the Bible. But after Ezekiel 38, I believe that they will. most of them will become theists. That doesn't mean saved. It just means, wow, God does exist. And so I think God is going to blast away 
that atheism or that agnosticism that is there. And it's going to wake them up to being spiritually minded and their relationship with him. And so, and then, you know, depending on the timing of all that, then you have enter this other mysterious figure known as the Antichrist or the lawless one. And then he, of course, is going to have a, a covenant, Daniel 9, 27, with the many, which we know, according to Daniel 11, 33, is Israel. Uh, it's not many nations. It is the, the people of Israel, which it, it very clearly says. It's very specific Hebrew. You know this. A Hebrew construction there that clearly refers to Israel only. So that's right. So when, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to he's going to have this covenant with them, which Isaiah 28 calls the covenant of death. So right there, you have a lot going on as it relates to their spirituality, kind of an awakening, but then also this deception uh, and this agreement by the, the coming world ruler. There's some other interesting things that are kind of associated early on here too. Um, I've often thought of what is What's it going to be like for Israel when the rapture happens and all of her evangelical allies are gone? Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of friends, as you know, who um, who we connect with. Other New Testament, you know, New, Co New Covenant believers have friends that are Jewish that we have witnessed to or shared with or whatever. And it, it'll be fascinating to see these little seeds that have been planted, how God uses them later, because we know it's going to be a time of deception, right? That's right. Over and over um, when the Antichrist comes with all power, lies, you know, lying wonders, deceiving. Um, so Jesus's first words, Matthew 24, 4, let no one deceive you. I find it fascinating to be, you know, whatever the explanation is uh, for the rapture event. Uh, again, I, I'm of the viewpoint that, uh, based on many passages, I think that the rapture is going to be witnessed. I think that I don't think we're just going to disappear and vanish. Uh, there's a Greek word for vanish, as we know. With remember the Jesus of the two guys on the road to Emmaus, he vanishes. The Bible never uses that Greek word for the rapture. But I have this. I have based on Scripture in my mind the the ascension of Elijah, the the ascension of Jesus, and the ascension of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. All of them are a witnessed event. And so in my mind, as I believe that based on those, those scriptures, that there's a pattern there that the not everybody agrees. That's fine. But in my mind, when the, when the world watches the church depart, what's then going to be the ex explanation for that departure? And, you know, many people will put an alien spin on it. Maybe the the aliens come down or whenever a ship shows up and they're like, see, we took them up. They went into the cloud. And then the ship comes out of the cloud. So, you know, uh, Billy crone has been talking a lot about that lady with his new book in that regard. But the key that I'd be curious, Lee, too, as well for you, what do you think will be the explanation for the departure of the church? You know, how will the world spin it? Will the Antichrist spin it? Will there be an alien connection? I mean, to me, that's going to shape a lot of what Israel thinks. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the the explanation most people were inclined to was like the new age karma type thing where Mother Earth is going to find some point of harmonious balance and boom, in a moment, all the negative energy is dissipates, mm -hmm. you know. But most people today in the secular world that are thinking about future events, uh, they are gravitating towards fears of alien involvement. When the church disappears, that's where their fears are going to go. And even in some, I've read accounts of people that are in or have had connections with the underground world and the occultic world and the secret societies. And in some of these organizations, they already understand that the spiritual world uh, are, is going to remove the believers one way or the other, <clears throat> they're going to get rid of them. Yeah. When you look at, as you said, for the last century, the new age uh, mediums that have been, um, you know, basically the enlightened ones or the alien spirit brothers or wh whatever they are that, you know, the, the panspermia idea, 
when these people get get um, channeled, these other beings, which I think are demons, um, they often say that, again, as you mentioned, there's coming a time when we have to remove this group from the earth. And, and you're like, you have the, the, the full blown, you know, like environmentalist mother earth kind of things, but you just have the new age people in general, that there's, there's this group that's, that's a hindrance to the, to the advancement or the evolutionary advancement. So to me, there's a lot of ways it can be spun. Um, the fact of the matter is the, I think Israel is going to be deceived, no doubt by the antichrist, but th there's this, there's this balance there. So even over the past Oh, gosh, over the past couple of years, what what people need to realize about the nation Israel is Israel was the first country to do a mass, overwhelmingly mass um, vaccination system. Right. They have actually they have great data, too, because they, they vaccinated everybody. But it was fascinating to me that we tend to think, you know, we, we generally have positive feelings about Israel. And you think, well, why would they participate in such a thing? Well, people got to remember that for the last 2000 years, the people of Israel have been ostracized. They've been uh, they've been pillaged. They've been raped. They've been abused. There's been Holocaust. Israel, what Israel wants more than anything else is to be accepted by the world. Yes. And it goes, it reminds me to the time of King, King Saul, the first King Saul before that, what Israel want? Well, we want a king like all the other nations. So it's fascinating. Even back then you have this spirit of wanting to be included. And so when, when Israel had an opportunity with COVID as an example, they jumped right in vaccinating everybody without really any discernment. And so, but why? Because they were pushing for the data, 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 and everybody, the world, all the nations of the world, they were looking to Israel as the perfect model. And I and, and you look and you go, well, why? Because they wanted the worldly approval. Yep. And so when you think about being ostracized for your entire existence, even in, in the modern 20th century, uh, with the partition plan in 1947, et cetera, and then to have the ability to be accepted so when the Antichrist comes along, and of course they're they're going to be ostracized, but the world leader comes along to give them acceptance, they're going to sell their soul to have that acceptance, and that's that's the scary thing. They're not going to look to their God. They're not going to look to their Messiah. They're going to be looking for just like John twelve forty three. The Pharisees loved the praises of men rather than the praises of God. So that really shapes, I think what the next few years post rapture might look like is who are they going to look to? Hmm. Here's a, a passage I've often thought about in association with Israel's deliverance at the time of Gog and Magog, where in Luke three 16, um, we read, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap. I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy spirit and with fire. Now, as a young believer, when I was in uh, some charismatic circles, of course, we thought you could be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then there was a second stage, if you were really spiritual, where you get the baptism of fire. Mm -hmm. um, but I've often wondered, is this actually not a, a spiritual thing like that, but this is a very practical thing that's going to happen when God reveals himself to Israel? Is is his deliverance by fire, a baptism with fire, uh, that will be followed by the baptism, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, according to Joel? H have you ever thought of that or connected that? You know, um, that's a great question. The We, we certainly know that the baptism of the by the the baptism, I would say, in or with the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is the baptizer, right? That's right. Yep. So it's not spirit baptism that the Holy Spirit's baptizing anybody. That's not what John says. That's right. He says that Jesus will baptize. And then if you come to go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, we see that that Jesus is the one that's baptizing them in the spirit like they were baptized into Moses. So there's an identity there. Yes. And so when you think about fire, the other the other thing that you have is in in the Gospels, as you know, that the disciples were like, oh, we'll, we'll go to the end for you. Remember the, the, the sons of thunder and Jesus makes the comment, are you willing to be baptized 
with the cup that I'm going to be baptized with. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's like, you have no idea what you're, what you're talking about, but you will be. So if we think about the baptism of fire, that, that is a great question. It makes you wonder whether it has a connection as well to Acts chapter 2. Uh, you know, the, the key um, image imagery there of the Holy Spirit is being tongues of fire. Yeah. So is, is that a connection? I think it's it's probably a little challenging. Uh, I'm not dogmatic on any of it, but I do find it interesting that you have those associations for sure. Absolutely. How about the 144,000? Where do you see them fitting in to the picture after the rapture? Well... Gosh, the 144,000. I mean, can't we have a couple more chapters? <laughs> I mean, yeah. all, all we have is chapter 7, really, and chapter 14 in the book of Revelation. Um, we can apologize to the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's it, They're not, they're, the 144,000 are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, these are very specific. Again, taking it very literal, you know, 12,000 from each tribe, um, excluding Dan. And I think maybe like Manasseh or Ephraim is not there, but um, but you have the, the 12 tribes represented. So, you know, I do think that these are literal ethnic Jews that most likely they are probably what we just described is maybe some of our friends who have been uh, witnessed to by their Christian friends. These are Jewish, currently Jewish non-believers that have been witnessed by their Christian friends. Uh, and, and maybe who are very friendly with evangelicals, and then we are gone. We depart, and then 140,000 get saved. To me, it makes great sense that you would have people who are relatively already advanced in their understanding of the Bible, because uh, again, there's there's look, there's Jewish people today that that love the Bible. They love not so much the New Testament for sure, but they love the Old Testament. Uh, they just don't acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, which means they're not saved, but they still have an understanding, a basic understanding of the, the, the scripture, at least the Old Testament scripture. And so with our departure, it would make sense that God would save 144,000 Jewish people because they would have far less learning, a far smaller learning curve in order to put Jesus right in the middle. Because so and there's so much writing in books today that you put Jesus right in the middle. Certainly the Holy Spirit's going to be uh, all powerful in the sense in their life. They'll come to a quick understanding. They'll have a quick study to know and then to begin to evangelize. So I think that uh, God doesn't leave himself without a witness. So I think post rapture when the church is departed, I think Jewish people, those Jewish people immediately get saved. And God uh, seals them so that they, they survive the entire time all the way up to Jesus' second coming. Uh, we see that in Revelation 14. But what a, what a great way for them to witness to their fellow brothers throughout that remaining time between the rapture and the second coming. I find it fascinating that in Revelation chapter 7, they're sealed before the four angels open up. Uh, or, or bring forth the first four trumpet judgments. Mm -hmm. And so it almost seems like the Lord intends for them to be on earth. Uh -huh. Now, it doesn't state that they're going to have a vocal testimony, but it's really hard to imagine how they would be on earth to be a testimony if it wasn't going to be a vocal testimony. What do you think? Well, you know, exactly, because I had one person that had asked a question a while ago, and they said, why do you guys keep talking about the 144,000, you know, witnesses. The Bible never says it. And I go, well, okay, fair enough. But how could you be, have that level of an, a com commendation by God, right? Especially Revelation 14. I mean, these guys get a great glowing review from the Lord, and yet they sit around and they keep their mouth shut. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, they are going to be here, and whether they are, um, I guess I would just say, why would they not be witnessing? I yeah. mean, it, it just, it makes sense, especially since they would be Jew. We know they're Jewish, ethnic Jews, certainly certainly uh, connected with the Messiah. Revelation 14 talks about them being connected with the Lamb, so they know who the Lamb is. That means they know who Jesus is. Uh, Revelation 5.5, 5, right, the the, the the, the lion of Judah, the lamb from the, the lion of Judah. So 
um, if you want to be super technical, you go, yeah, okay, I guess it doesn't call them witnesses, but they will be. Why? Because they're faithful. They're That's faithful right. believers. That's what faithful believers do. And they're sealed. So they, they know that they don't have to worry about uh, if you if you want one group of believers that will be spared 100 percent through the entire tribulation, it's them. And because even the two witnesses, they're spared for three and a half years and then they die. And Revelation 13, 7 says the saints that the Antichrist persecutes the saints and overcomes them, but not the 144,000. They started with 144,000 and they end with 144. So that would make you pretty bold, I think, to have that preservation, as you mentioned, to be sealed from the onslaught of all the evil. Now, how about the two witnesses? Where do they fit into the picture? Well, a couple things. You know, there's different viewpoints. I I put them in the first half of the tribulation. People, not everybody does. That's okay. Uh, I because I put them. I put them. I see them in Revelation 11 being killed at the midpoint of the tribulation, because then the Antichrist really um, he he establishes kingdom unopposed for the rest, and he's given authority and granted authority in Revelation 13 to continue for 42 months, completely unopposed. And so you do have the, the two witnesses opposing, uh, and, and they are witnesses very clearly, and they have miraculous powers, right? They have for they have the power to call down fire, you know, blood. So I, I see them as as the first uh in the first half. So the question then comes is who are they? Well, a um, couple things. You have a lot of theories, a lot of people take Hebrews 9:27, it's appointed for men to die once, and then judgment, therefore. Uh, you can't have people not dying uh, because of Hebrews 9.27. So they say one has to be not Enoch and the other one has to be Elijah. Well, Hebrews 9.27 is a, is a general phrase because you have a whole generation of, of people at the rapture that don't die. That's so right. Th there is an exception there. So I don't think Hebrews 9.27 is, uh, is a hard and fast. It has to be the case. Uh, you have others that, that see uh in Matthew 17, when Jesus is, is transfigured, it's it's a reference. It's pointing to his second coming. Jesus says at the end of Matthew 16 or Luke 9, it flows through. Jesus says, some of you standing here will not see death until you see the Son of Man in his glory, coming in his glory. And therefore, at the transfiguration, uh, most scholars will see that as Jesus gave them a portrait of a second coming. Well, it just happens to be there he is, a portrait of a second coming, and he's talking to two people. He, Moses and Elijah show up and they're talking about his coming departure, his exodus, um, as it relates from the earth in his ascension. But so some people see that as being because it's a portrait of Jesus, the second coming, Peter, James and John got to see it. And, and Moses and Elijah were associated with that a second coming. Therefore, the miracles that are happening through the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are very reminiscent of the ministries of Moses and Elijah. It also has some other uh, similarity to the law and the prophets, the law certainly referencing Moses, the prophets referencing Elijah. And so I think that's a very good candidate. We also know in Malachi chapter four that God is going to send Elijah prior to the time of the end somehow. So could that be another fascinating aspect is in Deuteronomy 34, when Moses is buried by the Lord, it says that his vigor and it was not diminished. Like, well, what does that really mean? So, and then, of course, in the book of Jude, you have Michael, the archangel and Satan arguing over Moses's body. So if you if you put all these together, you know, you can make an argument. But at the end of the day, people like, for, for example, Frachtenbaum in his book, he just says, it's just going to be two average Jews. <laughs> so he doesn't think it'll be Moses or Elijah because of some other reasons. But nevertheless... These guys are going to have a major, major ministry. That's right. Super, I mean, powerful ministry. Uh, there is a modern, uh, I think, error today. This might be worth discussing. There's a new view among a lot of the apostolic, uh, you know, the apostolic movement. Yes. Where they believe that the church, the church, they don't believe in a preacher rapture. That's right. But but they believe that the church is going to be the two witnesses. And therefore the church is going to be operating in these apostolic gifts that we are going to be going around 
if we have enough faith, calling down fire from heaven on all of God's enemies. So like the church is going to war, baby, and we're going to just wipe out everybody. So all the all the vengeance that's stored up in your heart against evil, you're going to get your chance. You're going to be the sons of thunder. Remember in Luke 9, they wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans like like Elijah did. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, you don't you don't understand what kind of ministry I have here. But so I don't think that the two witnesses are representative of the church, that we're going to go out there just blasting everybody. Uh, that just seems so contrary to, again, the spirit of Jesus That's right. during this age. Well, I want to turn now to a passage that oftentimes gets overlooked. I'm going to read three verses out of Rep, um, Romans chapter 11. And the, these past verses often get overlooked, at least in my experience, when people talk about what's going to happen uh, after the rapture. So starting in verse 11, I'm going to read 11, 12, and 15. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? In verse 15, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, if I was to paraphrase this whole section, I, I would paraphrase it this way. All right, folks, you thought Pentecost with the church age was amazing? <laughs> Wait till you see what I do after the church is gone. Oh, I mean, for all those that believe that God is done with Israel, they just don't grasp Romans 9 through 11. And, and Romans 11 is, <clears throat> is, I mean, it's beautiful. And, and here Paul is talking about really the doctrine of election. He just is. He, he, it's all through chapter 11. It starts in chapter 9. But Paul is thinking in terms that, hey, has God's, has, um, has God's covenant with the Jews, has he, has he cast off his people? Well, God forbid, I'm a Jew. And so Paul is saying, look, I'm an example of that God's faithfulness to Israel. Because I, I understand that um, people, if you think about Romans 1 through 8, I mean, you have the gospel, man. You have the power of the gospel, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And then you have the beauty of his entire presentation of what the gospel is. And you get to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for anybody that's in Christ Jesus. You know, Romans 8, 31, you know, if God is for us, who could be against us? You know, and, and, and then what can separate us from the love of Christ? It's just amazing. And you get to this crescendo in chapter 8. And then the natural question is, well, if these promises of God are so wonderful. Well, what about the Jews? And Paul says, okay, let's spend three chapters on that. And, and he talks about, again, all that God has done through them. But ultimately saying in chapter 11, hey, God has been faithful to the Jews. And here's the key. Blindness in part has come upon the Jews. Because Paul says, oh, I'm not blind. I was until Jesus saved me. But the ultimate goal here is that they, it, it says, have they stumbled as if to fall out of God's complete favor? And he goes, no, this, they tripped up. There's no doubt. And they are enemies as it relates to the gospel, but they're still beloved because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So, Paul is trying to say, look, guys, Gentiles, they're stumbled. you got glory from this, and, the, and, and you've got salvation, and it's gone over the whole world. What's going to happen when God restores him? Talk about the blessings. And that really was the goal of Romans 11 is the, is the fruit and the blessings are in the root. And the root is not Israel. I don't think the root is Israel. The root is the Abrahamic covenant, Amen. which then, of course, Israel comes out of as being a grandson, etc., and so when, when you look at the fruit of what has happened in the root, we have been grafted in. Israel is grafted in. Israel's natural from the root of the tree. We've been grafted in. And he says, hey, look, all the blessings, Romans 12, 3, or uh, Genesis 12, 3 to Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. And so when God restores Israel in the coming kingdom, all the blessings are still going to flow <clears throat> out of the root which is the Abrahamic covenant, certainly through the person of Jesus, the Messiah, but through Israel to the entire world. And that's why you have so many of the Jewish flavor coming back worldwide, Zechariah 14. All the world has to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
I mean, that's pretty amazing. They got to send representatives uh, to the land of Israel. Uh, we see Ezekiel 40 through 48. That there's going to be this new millennial temple, whatever that looks like. So God says, look, all you nations, they're going to have their own ethnic groups. Everybody's not going to be Jewish. But he says, if you don't send, basically, if you don't come and or send your delegation, I'm not going to send rain on your land. So you have the, the Jesus ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, which is Israel. Man. The That's going to be a, a blessing. I think it's fascinating, too, to observe the point that you made. The curse in general is going to be removed from the earth. Yes. But the curse can be particularly applied in particular circumstances if the nations do not submit to the rule of the king. You know, people need to remember that as we know that... At, the, the 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 sheep and the goat judgment Matthew twenty five. The only people that enter into the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, are believers. But That's they're right. believers in their natural bodies, just like we are now. So we can sin. Now, granted, Satan's going to be removed. All the demons are going to be removed. The, I don't believe there's going to be any satanic external temptation. But sin will still dwell, not in us, because we'll be glorified. Our bodies will be glorified. Sin removed. But the people entering into the kingdom. They're still going to be living in the same body like right now. This one that we have filled with the Holy Spirit, saved by faith through grace. But they'll still have the the, the flesh. That's so right. you, you'll have we have three enemies, right? The world, the flesh and the devil. Well, the devil and all that will be removed. But this flesh will be there. And we know that Jesus says in Psalm 2 and Revelation 2 that he's still going to rule with a rod of iron. That's right. So. There is going to be some rulership. Now, granted, it'll be far less. There's not going to be, I, I, I think, there's not going to be porn rings. There's not going to be human trafficking. But there, there still will be that constant temptation that's in the flesh for, for, the, for the earthly people, so to speak, for the non-glorified, I'll say it that way. They're going to have to battle with this. And so Jesus is going to come and he's going to be like, hey, Lee, Lee Bono, hey, you guys want to, I need you on a project for me, mission. There's, they're starting to start this porn ring over in the middle of Siberia. It's, it's a lush, it's not tundra now, it's, it's, it's paradise over there. But I need you to go check it out and, and take control of it. Yes, Lord, we got this. And so we got to bring my fishing together. pole. What? I'll bring my fishing pole too. Yeah, we'll bring the fishing pole. Lord, he says, take your time, just take care of it. So we are ruling and reigning with him. Amen. And and so we, we are glorified. Again, we, we have no more sin, but we will still administer and 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says that, don't you know, you, you will judge the world or adjudicate the world. We will govern the world. So we will be governing. We'll be part of that, that, uh, not, that we, we'll be part of the glorified administration that is judging or ruling over the non-glorified nations. So that means there still will be sinners and we'll still have to bring in, we might have to bring the hammer sometimes. But hopefully people will, will be on their behavior. Um, and we do know that the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord in that regard. But there still will be, again, I think what, what's God doing? This is a good segue in that people say, well, why? Why? God is going to say, look, I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you the perfect environment. I'm going to give you a glorified police force. But sin still wants to rear its ugly head and he gives this one last thousand years he removes satan there's no temptation it's going to be different than the garden because satan was in the garden no more satan and he's going to say i want you to see the sinfulness of sin it yeah. needs to be eradicated and this thousand year reign it's not eradicated and so i want to show you that even in this environment it still is not what it should be until we get to the eternal order Amen. I've often thought when it comes to the, the millennium, it is such an absolute final proof of the depravity of man mm -hmm. that I do not understand why the whole camp of Reformed theology has not embraced premillennialism. Because it <laughs> is so. such a powerful proof for yep. depravity. It's so true. I mean, if you ever wanted to, you know, in the flesh, nothing good dwells, right? I mean, it, 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 that's the key is that they still will be just like we are. They'll still be in their natural humanness flesh. 
Um, our flesh will be changed and glorified. Theirs will not. They, you know, as we know right now, right? The, the Bible talks about that the inner man, our inner man is renewed day by day. And Paul, Romans 7, that there's this battle between the inner man and the flesh. You know, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Or in, my, in your members is where sin is. So they'll still have that. And that, again, that shows you the depravity or the fact that sin has corrupted all the way through. But our new nature, you know, they're going to get the new nature. The new heart is new. So they'll have the same, again, the same exact setup that we have right now. Just we have external uh, temptations from satanic. They won't. So that will be, be a much difference. better environment. Yes. Well, we've been talking a little bit earlier about Romans 11 and this great revival style working amongst Israel. Now, I want to turn us to Zechariah 13 okay. and get your comment on a few passages here or a few verses. So in Zechariah 13, starting in verse 7 and going through 9, we read, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand, whoops, against the little ones. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. I will bring the one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. I, this passage here gets me about as excited as Romans 11 does. Absolutely. I mean, and this is where I think you have the consistency in, again, in literal interpretation between the old covenant promises and the new covenant promises. Uh, it also is, is a testimony that you can go from Zechariah 13, seven, speaking of the ministry of Jesus, right? Yep. To, the next verse, which again, there's no verses in the original. So within within a verse, within a few words, you go from the first coming to the second coming. And, and you see this in other places. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, uh, talking about the, the, your king will come lowly on a donkey. And then immediately it's talking about his, his second coming. So even in Zechariah, the verses will, will there'll be a gap. There's, there's, there's gaps of 2,000 years. Isaiah 61, where remember when Jesus in Luke 4, he's reading in the, in the synagogue and he says, I'm going to declare you today the acceptable day of the Lord. And then he stops. And the next verse is, and the day of vengeance. Well, in that comma is 2,000 years. So you have this fascinating perspective that if we fail to understand these gaps, like the 70th week of Daniel, it's being gapped off from the 69 weeks, we're going to be very confused. But in this passage, what a beautiful portrait that ultimately God's, again, God's heart in the tribulation period is to save Israel. Amen. He, his goal, his heart is to redeem them. And it's no different than in, in ancient times, in Old Testament times, where that you had rebellious people. He sends them into exile, but he brings them back. And so God's heart, ultimately, why? Is God, going all the way back, Deuteronomy 9 is an example. He says, don't think that I'm giving you this land because you're so righteous in or, or that you were the greatest nation. In fact, you were little. Um, and I went and I, I did this for you. And ultimately, God says, I'm going to restore you for my namesake. And so God is doing this for his own glory. And also, ultimately, because we know God keeps his promises. He's faithful. It's so beautiful for any of us. I mean. You think about prophecy, we can get stuck in the clouds. But in reality, this is so personal that we have a God who keeps his promises. Amen. Keeps his promises to Israel. That means he keeps <clears throat> his promises to me on a daily basis. You know, when, when challenging times come or I might feel lonely or might feel forsaken. Hebrews 13, 5, my favorite verse in the whole Bible, that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can't. And so to me... When we think about all these things that God's doing, it points us back to that relationship that he has with us at a very personal level, that all of his promises in Christ are yea and amen. 
And, and uh, just adding on to this, piggybacking a little bit, to me it's so exciting the God we're dealing with knows the very number of hairs on our head. We read in the book of Psalms that he stored up all of our tears. Yep. So he's very tenderly and intimately um, um, in, his, in his connection with us. And he's never going to change out of that character. And, and what we have to do when we go through trials and we start feeling bluesy and we start wondering if God loves us, we need to step back away from our fears and step into the promises of God and let them warm us like a blanket next to the fireplace. Yeah, it, it always comes down to really faith versus feelings. Amen. I mean, Satan loves to use our feelings against us because, again, you know, as a as a pastor, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of trick people, like to ask trick questions. I'm like, how many of you have ever felt abandoned by God? You know, everybody raises their hand because they have felt that. How many of you would dare to make a claim and accuse God of actually abandoning you? Nobody puts their hand up. <laughs> Scripture's so clear that God cannot. He can't lie, right? Titus 1 verse 2. I mean, you see these passages. It's so helpful to memorize scripture because, you know, Psalm 119, 11, I have hid your word in my heart so I will not sin. So when you put these things in your brain and then the feelings come and the emotions come or the circumstances come, we just, Satan wants us to live there. And we, you know, no, what do we do? We live by the word of God, every word that proceeds, not by bread, but by the word. So it's fascinating to me that when we see these, these rich truths, and that's why Paul brings up Romans 9 through 11. God cannot abandon his people. He did not cast them off. Jeremiah 31, you know, if God says, hey, if you can measure the heavens, which we certainly haven't yet, I'm out there right now taking images. I mean, it's going, the telescope is running in the camera. I haven't measured the edge yet. Certainly we haven't measured the, the depths of the earth all the way. And God says, if you can't do any of that, as soon as you can do that, then you can accuse me of casting out my people as well. Well, that'll never happen. That's He's right. Made the universe just big enough to we'll never find the end. So God can never cast off Israel. That's right. Amen. Well, let's go in a direction here um, where you've written recently. I, I would like to talk about the temple and the abomination of desolation and and. And this whole thing. So let's start with the concept of uh, we come to, for instance, Daniel 9, 27 and Matthew 24 in 2 Thessalonians 2. We read about the, the temple being present in the last days and we read about the Antichrist sitting in it and um, committing what is regarded as the abomination of desolation. So obviously the temple's not here today. How is this going to come to pass between now and then? You know, that's a great question. It, it always it always comes up because this requires, as you know, theology requires a very fine level of precision. OK, you know, study to show yourself approved of God. Right. Rightfully dividing the word, uh, not being ashamed. So when we think about the passages that you just mentioned, what do we know? All we know is that the only one that gives a real specific time frame is Daniel 9, 27. Uh, you can see that little bit of the chronology in Matthew 24, verse 15, about the abomination. But, um, and, and you see 2 Thessalonians 2 talking about the temple. It doesn't give a real chronology there. But Daniel 9, 27 does. In the middle of the week, That's right. the sacrifices and the offerings will, will cease. So what that tells us is that all we know, and, and this is important, Prophecy is gives us snapshots. For, for example, Micah 5 2 predicts that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Well, who would have known that it would have taken a census to get him there? Nobody knew that. Or, or if you take he was born in Bethlehem, that he'd be a Nazarene, and then out of Egypt I'd call my son, Jose 11. You think, how do you fit all those together? We really can't. It gives you a snapshot that this is what's going to happen. So we have a snapshot in Daniel 9, 27, that in the middle of the week, the sacrifices will be taking place and will stop. 
But what that means is that when did those sacrifices start? They could have started the day before. They could have started a week before, five years before, 10 years before. We don't know. All we know is that the temple is in existence by the time of the middle of the week. So we, we have no idea whether we're going to see the temple be built, whether it's going to be after the rapture, whether it's going to be the second week of the, of the 70th week, whether it'll be the second year. So we can't get hung up on that. But the fascinating thing, Lee, is that with the red heifer and all these other temple preparations all being done, it tells us that, well, all the prerequisites are are, are they're, they're done. They're completed. So all that's left is to simply start the building of the temple. That's going to require a, the political will of Israel, whatever yeah. that means. We don't know when that's going to happen. So, but everything else, it just tells us that we're getting close to the, the temple is, is in operation in the tribulation period. So if we see the temple getting ready to be built as we are, that shows us that the tribulation period is coming and That's it's right. very close. So, of course, for us, we believe the rapture is prior to that. And it just tells us how, how the, it, it tells us the urgency of the hour. I find it fascinating that 20 years ago as a young believer, there was a small nucleus or a small core of Orthodox believers in Israel who were really agitating to bring the temple in. Mm -hmm. But today it's not just a little nucleus of people. This is a pretty widespread sentiment and not merely amongst the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox, but even many Jews that would regard themselves as secular. You know, th that's one of the things I wrote about it in, in the Red Heifer book, because one of the things <clears> that <throat> I, I wanted to do is I wanted to show why this the, the age that we're in right now, you know, basically 2023 into 24 is different. And so I showed how it's different than even 20 years ago, because what you're seeing is I talked about the uh, the difference in the government. This is the most religious government in the history, 75 year history of Israel. This is the most um, I, I, I would say the, the the most temple favor or temple uh, pro temple flavor that you have in the orthodox movement and so I, I talk about how the, the views of the rabbis really since 1967 they were very much they forbid any jew to go on the temple mount that that started changing 15 20 years ago and so even within the within the orthodox movement themselves the, the idea of a temple and going up on the temple they get fifty thousand visits it used to be zero now it's fifty thousand uh, it's amazing that's changed but here's the other thing lee which i find fascinating is that even in the atheistic, secular, average Israeli, what you're seeing right now, especially after October 7th, is a reminder that there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the world. So yes. what you're seeing with a secular person, five years ago, they'd have been like, we don't need a temple. I don't want a temple. It's just going to cause trouble. I don't care about these religious people because... This, the average secular person had had an animosity against the religious Jews because, number one, they didn't need to serve in the military. They got stipends from the government. So all they're doing is sitting around studying Torah. They're not working. So they're getting freebies off the government. Well, the average Israeli who's working hard as secular didn't like that. Well, understandably, whatever. But what we're seeing now is this unity that has taken place. And this is how fast things can change. But it started changing before this in this regard. That when the Jews would go up, those Orthodox Jews that wanted to go up on the Temple Mount, they'd go up there. They're not allowed to pray. They're not allowed to, to, to read scripture. They're not allowed to have any sort of meetings up there. And so the secular Israelis is like, hey, you know what? I don't care about. I don't, I'm not going to pray up there. But that's not fair. Why is there this discrimination against my fellow Jewish brother that it's okay for the 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 Muslims to do it, but the Jews can't do it. So even in their hearts, they're seeing the inconsistencies and they're, so now it's a cultural or even a national kind of pride that's being defensive of their Jewish brothers, not because of religious, but simply because it's discrimination. You know, and I want to take up just for a moment, this, the thing about uh, anti-Semitism. The other day I was in a conversation and the question came up, what was the most significant thing that happened this year? Well, most people 
the most significant prophetic thing that would come to their mind would be, well, October 7th. And I made the observation, that's number two in my book. And they were like, what? And I said, number one is the anti-Semitism that has exploded around the world, where I think a lot of Jews and a lot of evangelical Christians were just operating under the assumption that people weren't so much anti-Semitic, they were just anti-Zionistic. But now it's become very clear, nope. Anti-Zionism is just an expression of anti-Semitism, and this stuff is everywhere. <clears throat> Especially because what you see is these protests that are happening and the discrimination that's happening for the Jew that's living in New York. That's right. nothing to do with Israel. has nothing to do with Zionism as it relates to the land. But when you have that level of hatred and anti-Semitism to those living outside of the land, that shows you the root of it. That's right. That, uh, it truly is anti-Semitism. And it's been amazing, too, as well, that, you know, you know, we've talked to Olivier Melnick. I know you have as well. Uh, he's you've written books on anti-Semitism. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been there throughout church history and it's there. And we know it'll be there at the end. Revelation 12 as an example. But after October 7th, all this anti-Semitism around the world had been there the whole time, but never had an opportunity to be exposed. That's right. And so to see hundreds of thousands of people that would have the insanity, I'm going to say it, the insanity, which means illogical, irrational thinking, if it is thinking, to go to a pro-Hamas rally and yet have no clue why, why, why they're there, that's when, you, when they're like, well, why do you hate the Jews? And ultimately, it's like, I don't know why, I just do. Well, do you want to think about that? This is what tells you that it's satanic. What's and interesting to me when we're on this path here, in Matthew 25, when the sheep and the goats yep. are divided before the Lord, what ground are they divided on according to what the text says? Mm -hmm. and, and this is where you have specifically how you treated my brothers. That's right. And, you know, there, there are different different perspectives. People will say, well, that's Jesus's brethren, um, you know, in, in general, which that, that could be true. But there's no I do think the context there is specifically about Israel, because we do know that during the tribulation period, again, anti-Semitism goes through the roof. Genesis 12, the, the, the Satan, the dragon goes after the woman. He sends a flood after her. You know, God brings up the earth to protect her, and then he pursues her for the next 42 months. She's given wings of an eagle of an eagle to, to fly away. Again, what we're seeing now, let, 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 let's think about it. Lee, you already quoted it uh, in, in Zechariah 13, 8. Jesus said that the time of the tribulation period is the worst time since the beginning of the creation itself. That's Mark 10. The cre right. I mean, Mark 13, the creation itself, you think this is going to be worse than the flood? According to Jesus, this is the worst time in the history of humanity, even including the flood. That's pretty amazing. So what you have there is if it would continue to go on, all flesh would be annihilated. But fascinatingly there is during World War II, you know, 18 million Jews, Alive, six million get killed, murdered. Okay, that's one third. Well, there's around 18 million Jews right now in the world. And Jesus, or we know in Zechariah 13 that there's two thirds. So that's 12 million. So as, as we now we're not endorsing this, we're just telling you what scripture says. That's right. This is a horrible predicament. It's no different than God saying that Israel was going to be completely wiped out at the time of the Babylonian captivity. God, Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel's predicting these things, and God says, look, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but this is going to happen. So yep. the same thing, we take no pleasure in any of this. We're just saying this is what Scripture foretells is going to happen. It's going to be a massive bloodbath against the Jewish people, and it's rooted in the anti-Semitism that we're just now beginning to see exposed. Amen. Now here, let's, we're, we've been on some negative things. Let's put a positive spin on this. So I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 12, which you mentioned just a minute ago. 
And there's some amazing material in this chapter, Revelation chapter 12. And I'm going to read, I think it's verse 6. Well, I'll start with verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne, her male child. So this, at bare minimum, is referring to the ascension of the Lord Jesus. Uh, many feel that it implies because the head ascended, the body is also going to ascend. So let's just assume for the sake of argument that we have the full man-child here, the head and the body. Well, then when we move then right into verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. A place prepared by God. Yes. You know, this passage is fascinating because if you try to put some of these puzzle pieces together, it's actually kind of fun. So we have here the fact that that I, I, I think that, at least for me, is a is a mid-tribulation scenario where the, the place that they begin to flee after the abomination of desolation, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see that happen, you need to flee. You need to get out. You need to flee to the mountains. Well, wilderness and mountains often go together. So Jesus is telling them to get out of Dodge as fast as they can. Don't even get your coat. Get out because it's going to be bad. You know, pray that your flight's not on the Sabbath or you're not nursing. So Jesus is talking about this mass persecution, which is consistent. So when you see the flight into the wilderness is a, is a place prepared. Well, you know, several scholars, this isn't, you know, I didn't originate this, but others, they, they, they talk about the ways in which this could be the Jews fleeing to Petra or in that area because certainly as a wilderness, um, Isaiah 63, when it's talking about uh, the, 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 the son of man coming back on earth at the end, he, he comes from the place known as Basra, which That's is great. another word for uh, the land over there near Petra. Daniel 1141 is another passage that speaks about the Antichrist not gaining authority for some reason, really odd phrase, that he doesn't get authority over uh, Ammon, Moab, and Edom, which just happens to be the country of Jordan. How, how strange is that? Uh, Micah 2.12 is another passage that speaks about the ways in which uh, a sheepfold, which is the, the Hebrew there, uh, is connected with Basra as well. And if you look at the geography of the the city of Petra, it very much is like a sheepfold. If people, well, Lee, you and I have been there yeah. together where it's the Sikh, this long, narrow passageway, and then it opens up into the whole city. I got to take some drone footage when we were there last year. It was awesome. And so if you look at all these passages of scripture, um, this goes back to the, the, the briefing pack that I heard Missler talking about, uh, Edom. You know, Refuge in Edom was his brief impact. I strongly recommend it to everybody. Very, very fascinating back from the mid-90s. But all these passages come together that Israel flees out, not not, not certainly every last Israelite but uh, or Israeli, but they flee out to this place that God prepared for this 42-month time frame. Amen. And I love being in Petra. It, it, to me, if I ever go back, I would love to spend three, four, five days just in Petra alone. That place was so amazing, and we didn't touch one percent of it. <laughs> no, but but we did. We did go to the top. We we were right. You were oh, with I didn't work. get quite to the top. Some of you guys actually went all the way to the top. Um, I just I was busy helping a few people get up to that temple site. Well, that's the top. That's the top. Yeah, you okay. were being a very good Samaritan and. But what I'm saying is that the the elite class we we zipped ahead and we got it to the top where it, you know it's 900 steps so yep. not everybody got to do that there was a lot of people that that were uh, just couldn't do it but we got to go to the top and see what they call you know the tomb of Aaron that temple oh yeah so so cool but yeah that, I mean that's pretty much the top but again we got to see the overlooks I mean just tremendous beautiful place lots of caves to hide out in uh stuff like that so what, whatever the full ramifications are i just think isaiah 63 you know verses one through three describe the messiah coming from basra at his return and his his robes are 
blood red because of the blood of his enemies. Yes. So he rescues them. Amen. He rescues them. The other thing I think about too, with this place prepared for them, in my mind, this implies when the Lord says, Hey, don't grab anything, don't grab your coat, mm -hmm. don't pack, don't grab, go back in and get your go bag, just go. And just go. Yep. Just forget about your bug out bag. Just go. And the Lord is going to provide for them. Yeah, that's to me, there's no there's no surprise here, because, again, it says very clearly <clears throat> in that chapter that God, again, provides them the, the, on the wings of eagles, which, again, yes. is Old Testament language that God specifically is going to thwart the Antichrist who goes after them and miraculous provision for what purpose? God is going after the one third. That's the right. Remnant. He's bringing them through the fire to refine them because that remnant is is going to be the ones that populate the, the millennial kingdom. They're the ones that are going to call out on the name of Jesus. They're the ones that are going to be, again, ultimately fulfill God's faithfulness. They're going to be the recipients of God's faithfulness to them in turning to the Lord. And this is where you see in, in Matthew 23, you know, Jesus saying, look, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so the, what, one of the best passages is, is Hosea 5.15, where the Messiah is speaking. He says, I'm going to go and return to my place, which would be heaven, until they acknowledge their offense. And they will seek me in their distress. Amen. Beautiful, rich passage speaking that in their distress, they will seek him. And he's waiting for them to acknowledge their sin, their rejection. And once they do, they'll call on him. Zechariah 12, 10, they will mourn, right? They'll mourn like for an only child. They will look upon him whom they pierced. And they'll be like, what have we done for 2,000 years? Oh, What's brutal. interesting to me is two things stand out, and they can be hard for some people to reconcile when we're looking at the tribulation. Because on the one hand, we see the greatest demonstration of iniquity and wickedness in the history of the world. We see the greatest degree of, of, of judgment since the flood that, that's capable of killing everybody. But on the other side, we also see what appears to be with amongst Israel a, an amazing revival. I mean, one third of the nation being saved would be the greatest revival in the history of the church age. And we also see in Revelation 7 amongst the Gentiles a multitude, a great multitude that no man can number. So how do you reconcile in your mind having this tremendously massive apostasy and this tremendous revival at the same time? Well, what we do see is that, um, you know my view, that I think that the apostasy of, of 2 Thessalonians 2-3 yeah. is in reference to Israel yes. uh, in, in their covenant with the Antichrist. Uh, but that doesn't mean, again, we know that 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, that, that that in the last days many will depart from the faith, you know, and they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So we do know that as we get towards the end of the church age, we're living in the age of Laodicea. And so there's the, the I think this is important. During the tribulation period, there are no atheists. There, there, there are no atheists. There, you're either going to be worshiping the dragon, worshiping demons, or as Revelation 9 says, Revelation 13 says, people will worship the dragon. Or are you going to be worshiping the God, the creator of heaven? There, there aren't going to be agnostics. There's going to be too much miraculous things happening, too much power, too much supernatural events, you know, hail, fire, you know, hurricanes, earthquakes, you name it, that are going to be happening. Blood, moon, sun. So, People are going to be worshiping something. So this is where you're going to have the, the, the majority of people are going to be worshiping the dragon. But you're going to have this large remnant that's still a great multitude. That's right. That is going to be worshiping the king. And then the, you have the Jewish contingent that's, that's getting worked on. They don't really come to salvation until the end. But the great multitude is a great multitude. That's why it's there from every tribe, tongue, nation, people, right? So... And they, but they also, we know, uh, according to Revelation 7, 16, when they come out, it says that the sun will no longer scorch them. 
Yes. Now, if you go to Revelation 16, 8 and 9, that's one of the bold judgments of wrath. That's right. So even though they're believers, they are still experiencing the wrath of God. This is what's, I, I said this in a comment the other day, this is what makes the pre-trib position unique because the post-trib, the mid-trib, and the pre-wrath all have, they all claim there are no believers experiencing the wrath of God. But that's not true. The pre trip right. says, no, there will be believers experience the wrath of God. It's just not the church. The, these are going to be those, this, the great multitude, the tribulation saints. And so Re Revelation 7, 16, and, and if you compare that to 16, 8, 9, it says very clearly that these people are going to be experiencing the wrath of God, especially that bold judgment where the sun is scorching. It's a very specific Greek word. It's the only place it appears there. But it shows you that as as they, even though as they're, they die, they get rescued. They're in the presence of God. But they no longer are suffering the persecution. They're no longer suffering the heat from the sun, the scorching heat. So they are rescued out of it. It says these are the ones that are coming out of the Great Tribulation. They've died, but now they're in peace and they have comfort. So they're part of the revival during this period, which, again, makes sense because with the rapture happening and the church gone, the lines are going to be drawn very quickly, I think. Well, let's. I got two more questions I want to bring up before we wrap things up this evening and head to Q and A. One of them is Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this whole seventieth week uh, is is drifting in the direction of Armageddon, the final showdown. So, I want to 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 read a passage here and get your comment on it because there's definitely. I mean. Armageddon is not just a World War III scenario. Let me So let me read these passages here. I'm going to read 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean frog spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. For they are demonic spirits performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So it just seems like there is a really deep undercurrent here of satanic demonic involvement to bring the world to Armageddon. Yeah, and I think that we got to remember too that <clears throat> that Armageddon is a is a fruit of the judgment of God, one of the bowls of wrath. Yep. And so God is allowing these frog demons to go out and to to gather the armies. Why? Because God brings them in His sovereignty to the land of Israel in order for them to be judged. Hmm. And so, but we also know that, again, it, it, it reminds me of Acts chapter 4, where Peter says that, that Herod, Pilate, the Jews, and the Gentiles were operating in the predetermined, predestination counsel of God against Jesus. And so, but God has a prophecy that Jesus would die, and he works his plan out, but the, the wicked Gentiles, or at least there, the Jews, the Gentiles, Pilate, etc., were fulfilling this the sovereign plan of God. And so, in the same way, Revelation sixteen, it, it's the same, it's the same purpose. God is allowing us these evil things to happen in order for the, them to bring people to the, the the land of Israel for what Psalm two. That why do the nations plot? Why do they plot? Why do they 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 conspire and they plot this vain, foolish thing? to war against Jesus. So imagine this. They're all there fighting, it, and ultimately they're there for many reasons. They're there to try to uh, neutralize the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going after Israel. They're, they're getting together to war together, and then they see Jesus coming out of the heavens. And then instead of looking at each other and fighting, they turn their guns on Jesus. And it's like, oh, my gosh. That's why Psalm 2 says the Lord laughs. Yes. It's like, Seriously? And so – Armageddon, ultimately, when Jesus comes, 
we're not as the church we're coming down back with them we're the armies on the white horses we're not fighting jesus speaks he destroys them with the sword out of his mouth he speaks you know second thessalonians 2 you know the antichrist jesus destroys them just by his very breath so we're not down there with swords and we're fighting or with guns um jesus says enough boom over so this th there's a there there are stages though of the battle, I wouldn't even call it the Battle of Armageddon. It's the stages of Armageddon where all these things are happening, these pieces where the armies are gathering together ultimately for, uh, again, as we know, Jesus, when he comes back, he goes to Basra first. Yep. And and then he's in his, the, the blood of his enemies there. And then he's coming to Zechariah or the, the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14. And so this is what you see. Ultimately, Jesus wipes them all out and it's just part of this his judgment against the wicked armies that turn their guns on him. Okay, one more point. And this pertains to the gospel. A lot of people have this idea. Some of it was old school dispensationalism, and some of it is people that are still clinging on to that. But they have this idea that the Jews, and maybe even the Gentiles, are going to be saved by the law mm -hmm. during the 70th week. I think there's a mistake, but I'd like to hear your take on it. Well, you know, this is this is good because uh, I actually wrote a paper on this in seminary. And because, I, you know, I do come from a dispensational framework. And so you have those that maybe could be uh, maybe hyper dispensational, if you want to say that. And so they see or they make claims. I'm not I'm not casting aspersion on anybody that might be that way. But dispensational offers a framework for people then to abuse it. And so the paper I wrote was how did salvation take place in the old Testament? Well, yeah. what I demonstrated that it has always been by grace through faith. Amen. Always. It's never been by the law. And Charles Ryrie in his book, especially his 1995 book on dispensationalism, he, he, he discusses this, that the, the, the object of salvation in every age is God. Uh, the, 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 the means of salvation in every age is, is faith. But the, the content of that faith changes depending on the age. You know, Abraham had to believe God for this. Uh, Adam had to believe God for this. Well, we believe the content of our faith is found in the fullness of the gospel. But it has always been by grace through faith. And so what I was describing is if you go back to from Genesis 6, you know, Noah found grace, right? Genesis 6, 9. All the way through the entire things, including the Old Testament, um, sacrificial systems, they were never saved by law. The law was there as a, as a tutor, but I, I, there's no doubt that during, I think during the tribulation, they're always saved by faith through grace. But I think that Jews, this is Romans chapter 10, they sought to establish a righteousness of their own rather than a righteousness that is achieved through faith. That's right. So what I what I envision is during the tribulation period, this is why I think the apostasy that's spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 is the apostasy of the Jews when this modern generation of Jews, rabbinic Jews or leadership, they commit the same sin that the first generation of Jews did, which is to reject their Messiah and to, and in this case, they'll re-embrace the law of Moses, the Mosaic system, which has been, certainly in exile since, you know, since 70 AD, once they re-embrace that, it's a fresh repudiation of Jesus as the Messiah and the gospel of faith, grace, the, the, the gospel that Paul preached again, that they are, they're seeking to establish their own righteousness through the law. Now that doesn't mean they're saved through the law. They've never been saved, but that's their perspective. So yeah. they rejected Jesus and salvation through grace or faith. Why? Because they want to establish their own righteousness, which they saw through the law, never worked. But I see that coming again during the tribulation period in their agreement with the Antichrist. Why? To reestablish sacrifices. They're and when saying, you we don't need Jesus, we got Moses. Yeah. And when you start taking like Isaiah 28 into, into the connection, you begin to realize that even though from a superficial glance, we say, yeah, the temple's getting rebuilt. This is good. Um, but when you look at the evil underbelly that's involved in this whole operation, there's a satanic element in the whole thing. Absolutely. This is this is the power of when you think about, 
you know, John 5, 43, that Jesus says, I've come in my father's name and you didn't receive me as Messiah. Another's going to come in his own name and him you will receive, I think, as Messiah. That's clearly the parallelism there. Yeah. Jesus spoke often in parallelism. And then and you think about all the language in, in, in the gospel of John, where Jesus, John chapter five, the same passage. Look, if you don't honor me, you don't honor the father. If you reject me, you reject the father. If you don't love me, you don't love the father. No one can have a relationship with the father except through me. So no matter what the Jews think that they're doing, they think that today that they have a relationship with the father. They don't. That's I mean, right. it is crystal clear. I don't care how much they pray. The average Jewish religious Jew today, I don't care how much they pray, how much they think they have a relationship with the father, the God of Israel. They do not. Because if they do, then Jesus is a liar. And Jesus says, I'm the way to the Father. Truth, the way, the truth, life. No one comes to the Father except for me. So if a Jewish person thinks that even their prayers and their Torah study, and they might be committed to the land of Israel, they might be the best Zionist ever. If they do not have a relationship with the Father except through the Son. Yes. And to Jesus me, I look at liar. I look, I look at this whole tribulation set up involve, in, including the Lord allowing Israel or even maybe guiding them in that way in some ways for the temple to be rebuilt. Yep. But it's part of his package to expose to Israel, first of all, the emptiness of the law for salvation and righteousness, but even more, the emptiness of their rabbinical traditions, which they've wrapped around the Old Testament. Man, perfectly said, Lee. I think, again, God's heart is to win them. But how often do we see God in the Old Testament say, okay, he's like he's like Dr. Phil. How's that working out for him? <laughs> you know, and you see him doing that. And he allows them to, for example, like, again, King Saul. They come to him, oh, we want a king, we want a king. And and he, so God says to Samuel, hey, Samuel, they, they've rejected me. I was their king. They rejected me. But let's let him have it. And then later he says, how's that working out for you? You know, and then so because they, they wanted to be like all the other nations. So in that same vein, this has kind of been the pattern for them throughout ancient Israelite history. And, and God's going to say, once again, you want to go back to the law? You want you want to you want to judge? You want to go back to Moses? And you, you think this Antichrist figure, this this false Messiah who gives you the, the freedom to to build your temple? It's not going to work, but sure, go ahead and try it. What I think is also interesting is, can you imagine the heart processing and the anxiety that the Jews will be going through when they hear Moses and Elijah or whoever the two yes. prophets are, whoever the two witnesses are, explaining the everlasting <laughs> gospel from Genesis to Revelation yep. and explaining the Mashiach from Genesis to Revelation? Well, and you know, the fact of the matter is, again, th this is like, as we're saying, the cycle over and over. John the Baptist comes on the scene, right? Yep. There, there hasn't, there, there's Amos chapter 8. There's a famine of the word, right? There hasn't been a prophet in 400 plus years. John the Baptist comes on the scene. And they're, they, they reject him or they're ambivalent to him. And then Jesus later says, hey, the... The ministry of John, from heaven or not? Oh, well, if we say it's from heaven, they're going to say, why didn't we accept him? And if we say it's not, well, then the people are going to lose favor with the people. So here you have John the Baptist coming with power, and, and, and you see it, Jesus himself coming with miracles. So if they rejected that, then the same, it's not surprising that they would reject Moses and Elijah, because I don't think they're going to be doing more miracles than Jesus did, the Son of God, the Messiah. So it, it is interesting how to reject the obvious. Yes, it's interesting how unbelief works. Yeah. John the Baptist comes not drinking and they find fault with him. And Jesus yeah. comes drinking and they find fault with him. And the yeah. Lord you know, kind of teasing me. So, okay, well, one of the little kids says, Hey, let's let's play uh, a wedding. No, nah, I don't want to play. That's not good. Oh, let's play funeral. You can't <laughs> police them. Nope. You know, Jesus, it's Matthew 11, right? That Jesus was, his reputation was as a wine bibber and a glutton. 
Okay, well, we yep. know he wasn't that, but he hung out with tax collectors. And, and it's that same passage. He goes, you know, John came neither eating or drinking, and you, and you call him like demon-possessed. Well, the Son of Man comes, and you don't like him either. You're like a child, like what you just described. And so he calls them out on their hypocrisy that they were they were creating a standard that was just pure stubbornness. It didn't matter then what God would actually provide. They were going to be stubborn because they wanted that righteousness. They wanted the kingdom for themselves. Well, brother, I've wrapped up my questions, but do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to close this with before we move into the q and A? I would say that the, the, if we think about Israel, um, we love Israel because God loves Israel. We love Israel because uh, we are blessed through the covenants of Israel, ultimately the covenants of Abraham. And so we don't blindly support everything that modern Israel does. Of course not. That, neither does God. But there's a default position that the reason we support Israel is because of the covenant promises to Israel. And so there's a future for them. It's not all fulfilled uh, in Jesus. There are literal fulfillments that will be fulfilled in the Jewish people. Um, certainly Jesus is the greatest Jew. And, and the millennial kingdom, that coming millennial kingdom will be when all the rest of the passages that we've described will be fulfilled. And God's promises to his people, Israel. And to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be fully and finally fulfilled with the Lord Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David in fulfillment of the prophecy that Gabriel gave to Mary. I mean, that's that's the full portrait. And and at the end, I'll say this. Until then, what do we do? And we, st we pray. We pray. We pray for the Jewish people. We pray that they get saved through the Jesus the Messiah. There is no other way. I mean, that really is our heart for them. Um, we pray, pray, pray without endorsing, again, any dumb behavior that all sinners do. I make I make mistakes. You do too. Modern Israel is going to make mistakes, but we still pray for them. All right, brother. Just in case there's someone listening that doesn't know the Lord Jesus, in a nutshell, a minute or two, what do they need to know to be saved? The first thing that someone needs to be saved is that, um, that we're sinners. I mean, I, I, I always, people say, well, I, I would sin. Well, okay, are you perfect? Anybody here perfect? Well, no, I'm not perfect. Okay, then if, you, if you're not perfect, then you need a Savior. And, and Jesus said, and the Bible says that our sin separates us from God. So that's the bad news. The bad news is we've sinned, and it separates us. But the good news is that Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in our place. He died as our substitute. And Romans 10, 13, that, that if we call upon the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. And Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So you have this, this offer of salvation for anybody that would be willing to put their faith and trust in him, to acknowledge that they're a sinner, that they need a Savior. Jesus died in their place. Man, it, to me, I think, what a great deal. I could go to hell forever? And pay for my sin if I could forever, or I could have Jesus pay for it for me. Sign me up. Amen. Amen. All right, Hannah Lore, we are ready for the questions if you haven't already sent them. And uh, oh, here they are. They're ready to roll already. Second Corinthians 3:27, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. Does that have anything to do with the rapture? And and I'm not sure what the rest of this question is saying. And having a normal tie, time? Uh, oh, and having, um, I'm going to guess he's saying having a normal time on earth until the rapture. So the spirit of the Lord, uh, wherever that is, there's liberty. What What's it referring to? So uh, somehow I, it was, I missed you there. Can you read the question again for me? Yep. Well, the question was a little bit rough in its phrasing, but the question revolves around 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I think the question is, does this apply to us right now in the present life? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, the context of 2 Corinthians 3 is in reference to the the difference between the old covenant 
and the new covenant, right? Yes. The old covenant, uh, based on the law, uh, was it was a covenant that was engraved on stones, is what it says, and it brought bondage. It was the ministry of condemnation. It did not bring salvation. It did not bring freedom. This is why Jesus could say to the disciples in John eight, uh, or not disciples, but the Pharisees in John eight, that um, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And they go, "What do you mean free?" And he talks about being a slave of sin. And they go, "We've yeah. never been a slave of any of every anybody," which is interesting. But uh, he's and then he says, "But he who commits a sin is a slave of sin." So here he was talking to the Pharisees who were very much following the or seeking to follow the old covenant system, it, but it did not provide what freedom and liberty. But he begins to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Second Corinthians 3, ultimately saying that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is so far greater than the ministry that was written on stones, which was the old covenant. And he even says there that that old covenant is passing away. And so, but this is where he says, again, in context, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's talking about the ministry of the spirit That's right. that, that is done through the new covenant where the Holy Spirit dwells in us, according to Ezekiel 36, you know, 26 and 27, about the new heart, the new, the new law, the new spirit. That's where the spirit of the Lord is. As it comes to the new covenant, there is liberty and there's freedom from sin, which is what Jesus was talking about. That we're no longer in bondage. If you slit sin, you're a slave. This is what comes up in Romans 6. Uh, Paul uses different language there. But that's the context of where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. It's in related to sin under the new covenant. Amen. And I've also thought in, in a related way about that he that is is um, come to Christ, you know, he's, he's dead to the law. And so what a blessing to be free from sin. The, the law of sin and death, and to be free from the yoke of the law. There's there's double freedom there. Absolutely. Yep. Oh, man, we are. I mean, this is Romans 8 all over. We are living under the covenant of the new the new covenant. Man, we have a great. I, I would suggest that we want to be careful that we don't use the doctrine of liberty as an excuse to be libertarian in our in our life and just squander our time and money on just good clean Christian front everywhere we look and um, because we do have obligations to be a good soldier in this life and fight the good fight of faith and we have one long eternity to be a fulfilled human being. Well, you know, Galatians is about that challenge of the freedom of of the difference between the law and and the freedom in Christ. And he in Galatians 5.13, he says the exact thing. Don't let your liberty be used as a license. That's right. Sin. And that's why he goes on and talks, and talks about the walking in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, yeah, he clearly Romans 6, right? Oh, should we since we have all this grace, should we just sin because we have grace? No, God forbid. We would never do that. All right. We have a question here. I'm going to ask uh, Hannah Laura if you will get this question clarified the question says everything is increasing except in the west salmons and plague and i'm not sure um what they mean by salmons you think that's famines oh maybe it's famines and plague okay i'll bet it is yep just got misspelled <clears throat> the typing gremlin so um are we going to see famines and plagues then in the West, so they're seeing a lot of them in Asia and Africa and other places. Are we going to see them in the West? Well, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate, uh, I think, fulfillment of of what we see as as famines and plagues, pestilences that you see in Luke twenty one, or even in uh, Revelation six, as it relates to the first of the of the seal of the seal judgments. Uh, some scholars will say that they're very, very strong, that the, the seals that we see as they match up with the Olivet Discourse in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24, that those are only going to be during the tribulation period. Well, others will say, no, we're going to see the precursors of those or the birth pangs of those um, beginning prior to the start of the 70th week or the day of the Lord, however you want to phrase it. And so I think scholars will argue both sides. Um there's no doubt that if you look at the history from, let's say, 1900, uh, earthquakes have increased. 
Uh, now, there's been they have gone up, even if you take into consideration greater seismic uh, instrumentation, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, uh, COVID was a pretty strong pestilence around the world and in the West. I would say that it affected more in the West than it did anywhere else. Um, will we experience famines? Don't know. Um, it depends on where you're at. I mean, we, the, the, one of the reasons that we are able to overcome some of those things is because we have such a, uh, a sophisticated infrastructure as it relates to technology. Uh, but if you go to some places like in California, some of the agricultural famines, I mean, look at look at like L.A. Marsuli. I mean, he lost his house because of the dry, um, you know, famines don't always necessarily, I mean, it's, certainly there's a food component there. But a lot of stuff was burned. So at the end of the day, I think most of that will be will happen during or be inside the 70th week of Daniel rather than before it. I would agree. During the millennium, are we going to be vegetarians? Hmm. Well, I would say that the answer is no. And the reason why is because well, for us as glorified people, I, I can't answer that. Don't have any idea. There, there's no specifications. But what we do know is that um, there will be sacrifices that take place during the millennium, Ezekiel 40 through 48. When you offer a sacrifice, you're killing an animal, and that, that meat is not simply just burned. It's, it's a very nice-smelling barbecue, honestly. God loves barbecue, and so do I. So in that regard... The food, at least for that, in that particular situation, the priests always eat the food. So will all the rest of the world be vegetarian and only the priests won't? I, I don't know whether we can say a hunt with 100% certainty. I mean, what's your thoughts? Well, I think definitely if, if you see it allowed for the priests, then it's a fair assumption that everybody will be eating meat. But we also see in Ezekiel that they're fishing in the Dead Sea and catching the same kind of fish that they catch in the Mediterranean. Yep. It's fantastic fishing. And I would assume it's a relatively safe assumption that this isn't sport fishing. This is fishing because <laughs> fish taste good. Fish, Yeah, meat tastes good. I mean, you know, um, I, I think in terms, you know, just so that people mm. don't, so we don't leave it unclosed, the... People say, well, what about Hebrews 10.4? You know, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That has always been the case. That's so right. even in the Old Testament, they didn't receive forgiveness because of the blood of bulls and goats. All those sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus. All the sacrifices in the millennium point backwards to Jesus. And so there's no, it's completely consistent. Neither one of them provide atonement, full, you know, uh, ultimate atonement. They are shadows, Colossians 2, 16 and 70. They are shadows pointing to Jesus. Old Testament points forward. Millennial period points backwards to Jesus' final sacrifices. So there's no confusion there. The book of Hebrews is not undone. Just to make sure we say that, because oftentimes when we talk about sacrifices during the millennium, there could be some confusion. How many of the Jews or which of the Jews have to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Well, that's a great question. Great question. And I think the answer comes in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, where um, uh, this comes from Arnold Fruchtemann. I think he's the only one that I've, I've ever seen say this. Uh, I give him full credit for it. And that is the, the the unpardonable sin where they attributed the works of Jesus to the works of Jesus through the Holy Spirit to Satan. And Jesus says, you committed the unpardonable sin. It'll never be forgiven in this age or the age to come. And so then immediately after that, he begins to pronounce judgment on that generation. And if you read Matthew 11 and 12, generation, 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 generation. And sure enough, um, they all received the guilt of that, which it was 70 AD. So, but that, that, that sin was um, committed by the leadership. Yeah. And as we know, in the Old Testament times with the nation of Israel, as the leadership goes, so goes the nation. And so, uh, for example, you, you have David uh, sinning uh, with the census in, in, in 2 Samuel 24, and yet 70,000 Israelites die. Yep. 
David didn't die. But so when the, when this when the leadership makes a decision, the ramifications go downward. So when they rejected Jesus and they they attributed this after you know the, the three three years of miracles, they committed the unpardonable sin. There was now our it was judgment was over. Israel was determined to be judged in 70 AD, no matter what happened after that. Now, individuals could be saved, and they were. Yeah. But in the same way, when in Matthew 23 and even Luke 19, he says, your house is left to you desolate. He's speaking to the leadership, which is the house. That's Whenever you have a house uh, in, in, in Old Testament language, it's referring to either the dynasty or the leadership. And so your house is left to you desolate. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, we know that it has to be the leadership in a future Israel. So the leadership of Israel during the tribulation period. Why? Because during the triumphal entry, the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus cried and said, no, it's too late. So even though they said it, they were the wrong people to say it. It has to be the leadership. That's my perspective. Amen. And it's going to be, you know, the Lord foresaw the 2,000 years of uh, Israel, so to speak, on the backside of the desert, you know, in Hosea chapter 5 and chapter 6. So yep. once they came to the close of that 69th week, that window opened up, that parenthesis started. And as some of the older teachers used to say, the Israel's prophetic clock stopped. And someday, again, in the future, it will start again. Yep. Okay, here's another question. Since we believe that the and see that the birth pangs have begun, is it safe to believe that as with childbirth, the pangs will not stop, but proceed until the culmination of the rapture in the end times? Oh, 100%. Um, again, going back to you take somebody like Tommy Ice, who, again, who we both love and respect, um, he would say that there has been no birth pains ever in the history of the church age, and there are no birth pains of Matthew 24 until after the church is gone. Okay? You that's, know what? One, that's one perspective. Yep. The other perspective is like, again, Dr. Oliver Fuchtenbaum. He's there at the pre-trib. He spoke there. Him and Tommy Ice are best friends. You know, he says, oh, no, the birth pains began in 1914. So he sees it differently that the birth pains then would begin to, or that would continue to increase like a woman in frequency and intensity all the way up into the tribulation period, ultimately to the birth, which the birth is reflective of Jesus's second coming. So, you know, pick your scholar, pick which one you like. Um, to me, it seems that there, there's too much evidence for, again, earthquakes as a birth pain beginning yeah. to increase in the year 1900 all the way through and increasing all the way up and through. So, does that mean we're going to have a lull of 100 years? I don't think so. Yeah. It's it's interesting. And speaking on that, coming into Matthew 24, you'd mentioned earlier about some of these prophetic passages in the Old Testament, like Zechariah 13, where one verse is the first coming and the next verse right next to it, right is, next the, to it. is the second coming. And it's interesting to me to see men grant that for the Old Testament. But when you come to the Olivet Discourse, it's like, nope, can't go there. I mean, we can have 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming, but we can't have seven or eight years between this verse and that verse. <laughs> yeah, well, you know how I feel on that. I mean, I, I think that the, the Olivet Discourse is a little broader, yep. uh, even because you, you have to include Luke 17 uh, because of the, <clears throat> I mean, he, he gave it just a couple weeks before the Olivet Discourse, similar language, Lot, Noah, days of Noah, days of Lot, etc., days of the Son of Man. So I think oftentimes when we when we seek to interpret the Olivet Discourse, we fail to include what Jesus said just two weeks earlier, which the disciples would have known. Yeah, and it's also, to me, it's inconceivable that the Lord would give such a big stretch of prophetic teaching and none of it in the Gospels, and it doesn't apply to the church, except for maybe John 14. I just I have a hard time going there. I know, yeah. I mean, yep, agreed. Because, I mean, he brought up the church in Matthew 16. I mean, that was the trans, you know, right before the transfiguration. So, I mean, certainly Matthew himself understood the ecclesia, 
And yeah. the, the church language is there in Matthew 18 as well. So he's the only one that brings up the church using that word. And so it would be no surprise that you have the idea of a rescue of, of God's people, uh, which is consistent. We know the full ex explication of it is Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, but that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't plant the seeds of a rescue before trouble. Okay, next question. What is meant by last in the phrase, the last trump? Is it an idiom or is it the final trump in a series of trumpets? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, um, I don't think it's a reference to the tr last trumpet of Revelation. I yep. think that's the least possible um, scenario you know, where I, I think, I think it is a Jewish idiom. I do. I think, however, though, the problem I have is where people uh, take that last trump and they try to apply it to the feast of trumpets. And so they'll be like, well, it's clear that um, within the, the, the feast of trumpets, uh, the last great, uh, Teruah Gadol, the great Trump, is that's the last Trump. Now, so what? Here, here's here's ultimately what I'm saying is, you know, again, as I said earlier, my background is in Jewish studies, so I took rabbinic theology in undergrad and Jewish studies, and so I'm very familiar. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do that. But what I what I learned through the years is that many times you'll be talking to somebody, Lee, and they'll go, "Well, you know, the rabbis think this. Well, the rabbis say this," and ultimately. I go, who cares what the rabbis say? You want me to take into consideration, as we just said, 2 Corinthians 3 says that when a Jewish person reads the law, they have a veil over their eyes. That's right. And that veil is taken away with Jesus as the Messiah. So you're, you're quoting all these rabbis that, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, are completely blind. So they have a veil. So why, why do I care what the rabbis think? Now, there is some interesting things that can help play in understanding some of the, the nuances of the New Testament. So, but I would say this, if I was to find a place in the Bible where the Feast of Trumpets was specifically had an, uh, a methodology for the ceremony of the Feast of Trumpets, and it said the last, the, the, the final trump of the sequence is the last trumpet then I would be like, hey, that's that's a pretty tight correlation within the Bible. Yeah. But when people bring in these rabbinic thinking or this middle age uh, uh, Jewish thinking and they try to force, they say, this is an idiom. I go, well, that, that sounds wonderful, but give me the proof. Give me the proof. Even show me in the Talmud as an example. But even if the Talmud said it, does the Talmud explain First Corinthians 15 or First Thessalonians 4, the, Tal the Talmud was 400, 500 years later. Yes. So yes. I'm a little <laughs> reluctant to, to, to put a, a strong dogmatic meaning on it. I think ultimately we don't know for sure. I mean, you might have a different perspective, Lee, but that's... Well, I, I don't have a, really a different perspective. I just have a little bit I would add to it. And the one is people tend to think that the Greek word eschatos means the last one in the series. And it doesn't. That's an application. What it means is the end. And so you can have, uh, like, the end of a nation can be a river or a mountain range that's a border. Now, you say the end of the nation, it's not the last river after three or four rivers, or it's not the last mountain range after three or four. It's just that that is the end. Um, the last person in the line is the end of the line. The last test in, in is is the final test. It's the end test. But it there doesn't have to be a series there. Eschatos was used for for the the front of the ship and the back of the ship. It was used for the ends of the ship. So once we get our mind wrapped around that, then when we come to the last trump, there is no necessary implication. Mm -hmm. just from the words itself, that there's a series of trumpets. Now, there might be, but we'd have to prove that from somewhere else in Scripture. Yeah. 
<clears throat> scripture is the final key. I mean, we can have a lot of speculation. There's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of Jewish idioms. I've pressed on people who, who I love and know and, and said, you know, can you show me some, some original source on that? Because um, even like the whole Jewish wedding system, it yep. all sounds real wonderful, real nice. And, uh, but there's nothing, I mean, the way it's presented oftentimes today is so super tight and clear. And you're like, that's not found in scripture. Yeah. You, you can't go anywhere in the ancient uh, literature, the ancient Jewish literature and find that wedding ceremony laid out as exactly as it's laid out today. <laughs> you can find bits and pieces in yep. 20 different places. And it's um, mostly by us Gentile Christians that are laying it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and no, no doubt there is some analogy between the Jewish wedding and yeah. the Bible. But if we don't handle that with a little bit of sloppiness in our thinking, and we try and have this exact system, then we're going to force the scriptures to fit our system rather than forcing our system to fit the scriptures. And that's always a bad move. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, there's, uh, there, there's a movie that had come out, I don't know, a few years ago. It was, was like uh, Beyond the Wrath or something like that. But it, it kind of went through all the Jewish wedding system. And I'll tell you what, it was extremely compelling. I'm like, man, they did a great job. I just wish it was true. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. There's a lot of things in there that I thought were, were true in more of a loose sense, mm -hmm. but that it was, everything was laid in a row, like all the ducks are perfectly laid out. Before the wrath. Yep. Yep. And I, uh, to be, I, I have looked high and low reading amongst the, the authors that write about the ancient Jewish wedding, tracking down their footnotes and where they're getting it from the Talmud. Most of them don't even have any references. They're just yep. quoting other preachers. But the few references you get, you track it to Maimonides or you, you track it uh, to the, the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud or the Babylonian Talmud or to some ancient rabbi. Um, and, and then you look at their passage and you only get about a quarter of the picture <laughs> but, and yep. it's good, but it, wh where's the whole picture come from? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and here, here again, you have full movies that are building this, this superb uh, harmony of the rapture and the second coming and the, and the pre-trib on the Jewish wedding system and the knocking and the, and the virgins. And you're like, man, they made that sound so beautiful. Again, I just wish it was true. Yeah. Now again, like you said, Certain parts are here and there, but that whole tapestry that's been put together, you won't find that in any of the ancient Jewish writings. So, again, ultimately, like you said, it becomes just a like an Internet rumor or, or not even Internet, but just one preacher says to the next guy. And now we're quoting all these people, but no one went to check on the source. I, I've discovered the, the more I check people's references, the more painful it gets to be to be a discernment preacher. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, let me give you one little fun example is, um, you know, this idea that um, the Valley of Hinnom, right, is is where they they burned all their, they burned their garbage and, and thus Gehenna comes from the Valley of Hinnom. And, um, and so uh, one of a guy, a scholar that I worked with, his name is Todd Bolin. Uh, he he did a, does a lot with, um, with pictures and stuff and the, the Todd Bolin library. If, if you guys don't have that checked out, it's pretty amazing. But he said, he said, you know, Mondo, I, I researched this idea of them burning garbage in the Valley of Hinnom, which is where Jesus got allegedly got the word Gehenna because it was a place of burning. He said, zero proof anywhere in the history that he knows of sources. And He's 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 a, he's got his PhD basically in in geography in biblical geography, and I said really. He goes, "There's no sources anywhere that I can point to, but yet it's repeated over." I, I repeated it because that's what I learned over and over and over. And so this one time, I was in the land of Israel. I'm walking just on my own in the Valley of Hinnom, which is just south of the Temple Mount, south of the city of David, and I see some people burning garbage. So, man, I'm over there. I got my long lens on. I'm taking pictures. And I'm like, this is it. A modern equivalent of them burning garbage. And then I come to find out it's completely false. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah. wow. 
Yeah, well, it's it's the uh, theological equivalent of an urban legend. It's an urban legend. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. I, and he even said, I want it to be true, but I need some ancient source to show it. Otherwise, it's just an urban legend. And that one, too, about um, that uh, where no man knows the day nor the hour. And I've heard it said over and over again, this is an ancient Jewish idiom that refers yep. to the Feast of Trumpets. Because of the new moon, yep. And so I have, uh, everyone that's that's written to me and challenged me on that, I write them back and says, okay, let's, let's just put it on neutral for right now. Go find a source anywhere. I'll take, even as late as Maimonides, I, I would say, okay, you got half something. But preferably, we want to go back to the Talmud or yep. earlier. Can you find an ancient source that this was in the Jewish mind at the time of, of Christ? Well, this challenge has been outstanding for a year, and there's just nothing forthcoming. Yeah. I've done the same thing with friends. Give me a source. Because, man, I, you know, I have a buddy of mine who's a big blogger, and he, you know, he's a very smart guy, but... Uh, you know, and I, I just said, look, this all sounds wonderful. And you, and you, you, when you repeat something enough, people start just kind of capitulating to it. But I go, give me an ancient source. Give me an ancient source. What's your source? And he goes, well, you know, the rabbi so-and-so. No, I'm not talking about rabbi so-and-so, you know, from 1978. Give me an ancient source. <laughs> right, right. Well, here's let's move on. Uh, why is everyone talking about the Antichrist, but there's no mention of the two witnesses? Well, we spent some time talking about the two witnesses tonight. Yeah, we did. We did. I mean, it was one of your questions. So, I, well, I think, you know, we have the theology of the two witnesses. I think one of the reasons why is, you know, is, you know, the two witnesses are... You know, they, they are, again, I think they're in the first half of the tribulation, but regardless, it doesn't matter. But they, they're just not as as, as as powerful and as long-ranging as the Antichrist. Plus, you know, everybody wants to know and, and, and make a, a guess at who the Antichrist is. The two witnesses, eh, I mean, uh, let me, you know, ultimately, Lee, what I see is that all of us, Christians, uh, anybody that watches movies, anybody that reads books, we always like a protagonist and an antagonist, right? That's we like right. villains. And the Antichrist is the ultimate villain. That's right. So it fits human nature. And the two witnesses are kind of like, kind of like ancillary to the main story. You have, the, you know, the, the Antichrist, and then you ultimately have Jesus Christ, those two squaring off together. But I think that's why the Antichrist gets more attention, because ultimately he gets more attention in the Bible than that's the two right. witnesses. I mean, the two witnesses... You know, Revelation 11, you know, the book of Zechariah, you, you cut one chapter there, the two olive trees, but there's really not much else about them. Why does Satan accuse us night and day in heaven if he knows we are saved and protected by the blood of Christ? Doesn't he know it's futile? Well, I mean, who can get into the mind of Satan? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you think, <clears throat> ultimately, I want to ask him, why'd you do it? The Bible says you are perfect in wisdom. How in the world, in being perfect in wisdom, which imagine you're perfect in logic, that you would think you could outsmart or outmaneuver a God who is all powerful and all knowing? I mean, that has to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, yeah. that's really, I mean, really? Perfect in wisdom? And I'm not trying to mock anything. I'm, I would seriously say, what in the world? But see, ultimately, it comes down to pride. That's right. Pride There's an old proverb that says, fire in the heart sends smoke in the head. So, you know, he, he for some reason, his pride has blinded him so much that I think he still thinks he's going to win. Yeah, so, I I think when it comes to something like Armageddon I, I or or the persecution of the Jews trying to eradicate all of them, I think he thinks he's if he plays his cards right, he's got a slim hope, slim chance of actually pulling this off and stopping the kingdom. Yep. I think he, I think he believes it. It's like the, the kid in the, in the schoolyard that's, you know, that's small and he's, he's, he's getting beat up by the guy that's twice his size, but because he has so much pride, he never quits. He keeps going back. I'm going to do it this time. And he just gets manhandled and thrown. He keeps coming back, keeps coming back. And there's only one reason it's pride. 
That's I'm right. going to do it this time. No, not going to happen. Okay. I'm not sure exactly where this question is going. Mondo, do you agree with Arnold Fruchtenbaum that Matthew 23, 39, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, means that SC is conditioned to Israel calling. Oh, the second coming. Oh, so, oh. So I, I, there's, I, I think um, Fruchtenbaum, in his book, The Footsteps of the Messiah, he also has a um, a manuscript on this. I read this 25 years ago. He It's called The Basis for the Second Coming of Jesus. And in that manuscript, which he's incorporated into the book, this is where he's talking about Matthew 23, that you'll have these until. You will not see me until. I return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. And so ultimately, I would say that he makes a great case biblically that the basis for the second coming is getting the leadership of Israel to ask him to come back. So I always kind of make the joke, which if we could just simply get Netanyahu in the Knesset today to say, we're, we're surrounded by our enemies. We repent of crucifying Jesus. Jesus, you're the Messiah. Will you please come back and rescue us? He would come back. Amen. But that's pretty slim. We know prophetically that that's the purpose of the tribulation. In their distress, right. they will seek him. Right. And Jacob, you know, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It's a time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. Amen. So, so those are the passages. So I do agree. I think Fructibon hit the nail on the head there. Yep. Will the 144,000 be all over the world or just in Israel? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to know. What we do know is in Revelation 14, um, at least at the end of the tribulation, it speaks about them being with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Yep. So there, there's, I, I guess we, we, there's not enough information to be able to answer that with full you know, certainty, I think. Will the, two, or will the witnesses go two by two or in small groups? Or be together? Well, if they're talking about the 144,000, yep. um, I imagine they're trying to pattern that after either Matthew 10, where the 12 went out two by two, or the 70 went out in Luke chapter 10, two by two. Um, the 144,000, it doesn't say anything about that two by two. So, again, not enough information to answer that. If we're ruling and reigning with Christ, why wouldn't we submit or send representatives to the feasts? Well, it's not talking necessarily about us. It's in Zechariah 14, it's talking about the nations. And so remember, the nations are living in their non-glorified bodies. And I think they have structure, they have leadership, they have governmental organization. But we're on a whole different playing field. I I I, I don't I don't imagine Lee. And I don't know the answer, but I don't imagine because we know that once we get our glorified bodies, there's no marriage. You know, I'm not going to be sitting in my home, you know, with a wife, hanging out, just doing my daily little thing. I think that we are ruling and reigning with him, that we are the international arm of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And, and, and so we're going to be, will we even need sleep? I mean, the, the non-glorified body will, but we, I don't know. I, I don't think that we would. So I think that we will be operating 24-7. I do believe that we live on a globe. Sorry for all the flat earthers. Um, we do live on a globe, which means that, that there's always going to be daylight somewhere, right? Yep. And so in that regard, what will we be doing? How will we get there? Don't know. We don't have the details. But so I, I don't necessarily think that, that that's, that's for us. The nations, Zechariah 14, I think it's referring to all those in their non-glorified bodies who are who are living normally and having children and families and structure. But we will be uh we will be operating as the Lord's right arm, so to speak. Well, this question, I'm struggling here to try and understand it. I've been feeling on what is the end fruit of the creation story. 
Most days it's saving grace or to free us from sin. But as I dwell on it, these fruits along the way, but what's the end? So I think what he's asking is, in in the creation and salvation story, is there something that's in it for us beyond the fact that we get saved? Oh, well, I think in one sense, <clears throat> it would be wise to remove us from being the focus. The focus is the glory of God. Yes. That everything that God does is for his glory. Uh, creation, plan of redemption, the whole salvation story, the creation of the angels. Now, we're part of that story, and we have a big big part of the story, but we're not the only part, and we're not the center part. The center ultimately is the Lord Jesus. And so if, if we think about overall, um, where are we going? Uh, the salvation story, as we currently have a grasp, ends at Revelation chapter 20, because that is the age of where sin dwells from Genesis, basically Genesis three to Revelation 20 in that, in that, in those bookends is where sin is. Well, once sin is removed, then we enter into the eternal order, Revelation 21 and 22, where there is no sin. There is no curse. Uh, certainly the earth is going to be central, but we, what I wish we knew more about what our future holds. But what we do know is that at that time, all of us, are going to be the children of God. This is why Romans 8, basically 17 and 18 says, man, you know, we're joint heirs with Christ. Uh, whatever he inherits, we inherit. But the sufferings of this present world are nothing compared to what we will be revealed in us. And so that really is where we're going. The future that we have being um, redeemed and restored back to the ultimate uh, children of God, which is what we were destined to be. Amen. Without any sin, man, our I've often thought about so what God intended to have in the garden expanded to the entire universe. Uh, you know, Lee, I got great pictures I'm taking right now. I can see it over here, what it's taking. And uh, hopefully we'll get to go, you know, I'm taking a picture of the Pleiades right now. Oh. And it's just stunning. And so um, I'll be able to share that in a couple of weeks. But I think I'd like to go there. I'd like to go to that the Pleiades and 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 see what's happening there. And and will we get that opportunity? Man, I hope so. I tend to think so. Now, what's interesting about the Pleiades, just kind of a little rabbit trail, but in ancient mythology, it was significant. That that, that was connected with comets, it was connected with the angry gods, it was connected with judgment. It was connected with uh, the, well, we would even call them the Nephilim mm -hmm. and the giants. And what's also interesting is I put the Pleiades in my prophecy fiction series as the source of the heavens from whence the judgment comes in the last days, that big <laughs> comet. And, and imagine there where, you know, who, who knows? You know, are there, you know, are there other, creatures that god made in his big universe i mean the universe is so huge we can't even grasp it will we be going there and sharing the wonders of what god has done on earth i don't think jesus dies on a million different planets he came and he's human no. okay he came to earth he died on earth and so um he's a human and he'll be a human forever so we're very special yeah I've but tended to think that, with you know, the angels were the, the sons of God. The human beings are going to be the new sons of God, elevated a little bit above the angels. And then James you. says that we're the first fruits of all creation. My sense of just weighing the scriptures on the subject is that there's going to be animal life on a lot of planets in Goldilocks zones around a lot of stars and a lot of plants and animals. But there won't be any intelligent life that ascends much above the apes and that approaches the human beings. Yeah, I mean, we we what we what we have in store for us, we know that we won't be bored. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, will our glorified bodies be male and female? Well. 
I don't see why they wouldn't be. Um, you know, we know that Galatians 3.28, that uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. There's neither male nor female. But he, he's, he's, he's talking about the ways of salvation there in the book of Galatians. That's right. There's That's only right. one way. There's only one way of salvation. Um, the fact of the matter is when, when Jesus received his glorified body, uh, I don't think he just turned into this. Um, all of a sudden he turned to a non-male looking person. Um, now, ultimately, will we have uh, the equipment, okay, if we're trying to keep it PG? Um, don't know. I mean, the, the Bible, here again, these are fun things to ask, but yep. yeah, ultimately, you know what I want to do, Lee? I want to give somebody a Bible verse. And there's no Bible verse that I can whip them to to say, hey, in our glorified bodies, are we all of a sudden going to be ceased to be male or female? I, I, don't, I don't know why that would need to be the case. Uh, no. I, I, again, I don't know why that would why that would make us more spiritual or more holy. Nope. I think there's a, the tendency that comes out of the Gnostic theology is trying to bring everything to neutral yep. and trying to bring everything to a state that's non-physical. And my thought is, I see us. The, the scriptures seem to teach we're going to be glorified human beings. Um. Exactly what that's going to entail might be another question, but we're certainly not going to be glorified non-human beings. Yeah, exactly. And again, I mean, Jesus is still a man. I mean, and, and Paul, look, I guess, you know, maybe we do have a passage there, a hint. Because in 1 Timothy 2, 5, Jesus says there's one God, and there's, and there's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Now, he wrote that to Timothy you know, in 55, 50, 60 AD. So yeah. Jesus was still a man in his glorified body. So there's proof. There we go. We stay in our genders. That's right. Will the tribulate, no, the tribulation martyrs, will they rule in the millennium with us or will they be like the um, tribulation saints who come out of the tribulation? Well, they're, they're because in Revelation 20, you know, basically verses four through six, they, the only way that they can rule, and it says they do rule in verse 6, very clearly. It says they're part of the first resurrection, yep. but they, they they come to life. So the only, and, and so because they're dead, they, the only way they can come back to life, which, which I would assume, which maybe I shouldn't, that they don't just come back to life because many of them might have been dead for a long time. But they come back to life in their glorified bodies. That's and right. And then they rule and reign during the millennium period alongside us. But the idea that maybe they just come back to life like like Lazarus did, uh, that they some of them might be dead for three or four years. I don't see that. I see them coming back to life in their glorified bodies, thus ruling and reigning with us during that period. So they absolutely will not be like the non-glorified tribulation saints who survived the whole time. And then go into the kingdom to then repopulate. Uh, but because they're resurrected, that's over for them. They're, they're, they're children of the resurrection now, like Luke 20 says, where there's neither marriage uh, nor are they given in marriage. We're getting close to the end here, Mondo. Do you think that the Jews have sacrificed one of the red heifers already and they're keeping the ashes, keeping them secret? Well... Now, I don't know everything, but um, I am in constant contact with um, one of the gentlemen who is has been there from the beginning, uh, part of the Bonet Israel group. Um, I get emails from him probably every other week. Now, I'm not saying that he would have to tell me, but so far when I talk to him, he says that they're still on schedule for doing the Passover 2024 ritual ceremony on the Mount of Olives. He did tell me that one of them, that all of them, first of all, all of them are in Shiloh at the visitor center, that one of them is like 99% disqualified. Um, but the other four have not been disqualified. All of them are of, the, are of age now. So this is kind of amazing. We're living in prophetic times in that this is the first time in 1900 years that we have at least one qualified red heifer to be slaughtered at the proper time in the proper location. So that hasn't happened. I mean, talk about living in exciting times, but whether they've done it or not yet, 
Um, according to him, they have not. Now, maybe they have, and it's it's in secret. I do think, I do think, my opinion, um, he describes to me that they, they are looking forward to doing it uh, in a public ceremony, which I think would be very foolish for uh, security reasons. Um, but my gut feeling is that they will come and say, hey, everybody, two weeks ago, we performed the ceremony. Here's the video. And now we have the ashes. And so it's done and over and it's secure. But again, we'll see. We'll see. Will every single Jew be saved since they're the chosen? Well, I guess that, that, that I don't know. I mean, we know that not every Jew has been saved. First, Caiaphas. Um, you think about other Jews in the Old Testament. Uh, think about uh, the wicked king, you know, the wicked kings of old. Judas. Uh, Judas, exactly. Yeah, Judas, definitely. So if they're asking about all Jews of all time, the answer is no, clearly. Uh, yep. But and that's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if we're talking about at the end of the tribulation period, I do think that all it says, Romans 11, 25, all Israel will be saved. I do. I take it very straightforward that um, at that moment that the one third that are left are all going to be saved and that Amen. will equal the remnant. Therefore, Amen. the scripture will be fulfilled. All Israel saved because they're the only ones left. That's my thought. Are the horsemen in Zechariah the same as the horsemen in Revelation, the four horsemen in Revelation? I, I don't think so. I think that, as always, when you have a similarity of language, um, there could be similarity of, of, uh, of topics. Or, as we know as well, in Old Testament theology, there's a lot of things that are um, typological or that are repetitive in god's world um so it, it's possible that there might be some correlations but i mean in the sense of complete identical i mean what's your thoughts well i would say there's a couple differences in my mind at least uh, the ones in zechariah appear to be scouts that report back to the lord and the ones in revelation uh, are bearers of judgment the other thing i'd point out is that you actually have just the four horsemen in zechariah and in the book of Revelation, there's five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I think what you bring up is, again, some of the distinctions that are there. So that's why I think, does it hearken, does it make us want to hearken back to that language? I think it does. But as always, we have to look at each of the individual texts and see the, the commonalities and the differences. Will the 144,000 Jews in the remnant hiding from Antichrist Will they go and repopulate the earth? The 144,000? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people make um, a, they focus on the idea that they're virgins, right? Yeah. And, um, but what we don't know is their, their status as it relates to glorified or non-glorified in the sense in the long term. I do think that they're non-glorified when they start. Yeah. And, and they're committed through through the tribulation period. So that being the case, as we as we transition into the millennium, uh, most likely they're still alive in their non glorified bodies. Now, what um, what is their future? The Bible doesn't tell us. I yeah, mean, that's right. We can speculate, but the Bible doesn't tell us. Last question. If the world after the flood started with eight people, is it possible the millennium will start with uh 888,000 people or something like that? Just guessing. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we know that eight clearly is the number of new beginning. Uh, yeah. It's oftentimes, if you look at the, the gematria or the numerology of Jesus's name, it, it usually always is divisible by eight, which is kind of fun. Um, and then if you start comparing like with Noah, in the eight there again why is there eight well there was a new beginning after the flood there with eight people and so uh eight is is a new beginning uh after the number seven which is shows you complete and so when you start looking at that um i don't think that god does anything haphazardly uh but i, I will say this that 
you know, are there coincidences that exist in the world? Some people say there are no coincidences with God. Well, yeah, but oftentimes I think as human, are there are there coincidences that happen? Well, Proverbs sixteen thirty three would seem to imply that there's not that you no know, the even the dice fall into the lap of the Lord and do what He wants. But I think we sometimes uh, fill co- what circumstances with our own meaning of what we want it to mean rather than what God might intend. So uh, in that regard, um, will there be 888,000? Again, (laughs) I wish we had an answer. Uh, We will have an answer someday. Yeah, one day we will, yes. But in advance. um, Well, that was a lot of questions. That was a lot of questions tonight. I, I want to thank everyone for uh, hanging out long enough to sit through the q and I want to thank my moderators for doing, again, such an outstanding job. We thank you for actually uh, caring enough about the things of the Lord to ask questions, to, to use your God-given brain on a God-given revelation. That is right there is the essence of spirituality, by the way using your God-given reason on the God-given revelation with a God-given determination to submit to the Word of God. Um, So, folks, I want to thank you. I give you a God bless you for the night and give you a God bless you for the new year. May you all press forwards, onwards and upwards, looking for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Mondo, if you hang on for just a moment after I close things up, we'll just Have a wind down for a minute or two. So folks, take care. God bless and good night.